Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on today's program, Anna Mateo has a story about a Polish institute that considers house cats to be an invasive species. Faith Perlow answers a question from a listener about the difference between the words heritage and inheritance. Later, we will hear a story by Jack London called Quiche. But first... India's film industry is one of the biggest in the world, producing an average of 2,000 movies a year. But few of them become popular among Western moviegoers. Indian film director S.S. Rajamoli calls that a disappointment. We have a long tradition of storytelling in India. We have probably the oldest and most colorful stories, Rajamoli said. Not being able to travel across borders has been a disappointment, he said of his limited success in foreign markets. Things might be changing, however, with Rajamoli's new movie RRR, the three-hour-long Telugu language action film is one of India's biggest hits ever. It has also climbed box office rankings in the United States. And it has found bigger popularity on the streaming service Netflix. For nine weeks, RRR has ranked among the top ten non-English language films on Netflix. It is currently one of the top ten most popular films in 62 countries. The film is available in 15 languages on Netflix. RRR is based on Hindu mythology and the freedom fighters who fought British colonialism. For many people, RRR is their first experience with Tollywood, the Telugu movie industry center. For some, it might even be their first time watching an Indian film. Tollywood, Bollywood, and others make up India's huge film industry. The names are meant to sound like the U.S. movie-making center, Hollywood. RRR has some special effects that make the film similar to a Hollywood superhero movie but it is also deeply connected to Indian mythology and present-day conditions. RRR stands for Rise, Roar, Revolt. It also refers to Rajamoli and his two stars, in T. Rama Rao Jr. and Ram Charan. This is Charan and Rao's first film together. Both come from highly successful families in the movie industry. They play real-life Indian revolutionaries who team up in 1920s British-controlled India. In returning to the beginnings of modern-day India, RRR relates to the nationalism of today's India. 48-year-old Rajamoli has risen to become one of the country's best-known directors, he launched his two-part Bahubali epic in 2015. The second part, which appeared in 2017, is the country's biggest box office hit. Bahubali was a Telugu hit. It was also the costliest Telugu film ever made, with a budget of $72 million. Its success was a sign that Tollywood in India's south had possibly passed Bollywood as the country's top movie factory. Rajamoli called the worldwide popularity of RRR a surprise to him. The director is now working on his next film. He is often asked about whether he would ever want to make a Hollywood movie. RRR, however, suggests that Western moviegoers are interested in Indian films, 
and Rajamouli's aim is to make Indian films for India and the world. Because of the success of RRR with Western audiences, Rajamouli said, I am trying to make a film for the entire world. A respected Polish scientific institute has classified common house cats as invasive alien species. The institute did this because of the damage cats cause to birds and other wildlife. Some cat lovers have reacted emotionally to the decision. The strong reactions have put the main scientist behind the decision on the defensive. Wojciech Solasz is a biologist at the state-run Polish Academy of Sciences. The Academy's Institute of Nature Conservation runs a database of invasive alien species. He said he was surprised by the public reaction following the addition of Felis Catus in the database. Felis Catus is the scientific name for the common house cat. The database already had 1,786 other species listed with no objections, Solash told the Associated Press on Tuesday. The public anger, he said, may have come from the media. Some media reports may have misinformed people that the Institute is calling for wild and domestic cats to be killed. Solash described the growing scientific belief that domestic cats harm biodiversity. This is because of the number of birds and mammals that cats hunt and kill. The criteria for including the cat among alien invasive species are 100% met by the cat, he said. On a recent television show aired by independent broadcaster TVN, Solash debated a veterinarian on the issue. The veterinarian, or animal doctor, was Dorota Suminska. She is the writer of a book called The Happy Cat. She challenged Solash's belief that cats are dangerous to wildlife. She pointed to other causes of decreasing biodiversity. These causes include a polluted environment and city buildings that can kill birds in flight. Ask if man is on the list of non-invasive alien species, Suminska said. She argued that cats were being unfairly blamed. Solash argued that cats kill about 140 million birds in Poland each year. The Polish Academy Institute published a post on its website, seeking to clear up its position on the issue. The Institute said it was opposed to any cruelty towards animals. It also argued that its classification was in line with European Union guidelines. As far as categorizing cats as alien, the Institute noted that Felis catus was domesticated around 10,000 years ago by ancient civilizations in the Middle East. That means that cats are not native to Europe from a scientific point of view. The Institute also suggested that cat owners should limit the time their pets spend outdoors during bird mating season. Hello! This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question from Nora about the difference between heritage and inheritance. 
Hi, VOA Learning Team. Would you please help me to understand the difference between inheritance and heritage, and in which situations we use each of them? Thanks, Nora. Dear Nora, thanks for this question. Heritage and inheritance are similar words. They are both nouns, and share some meaning. Both represent something passed down through generations. The big difference in these two words is how we use them, and their associations. Let's start with heritage. Heritage can be property, traditions. Customs or culture passed down through generations. Heritage is something you get just by being born. Heritage is tied to the history of a person, group, or nation. For example, many Americans who are born in the U.S. have heritage from other countries. I have Italian heritage, for example. My great grandfather was born in Italy, but I was born to Americans in the United States, so I have American heritage also. Another example is when we talk about language. Heritage speakers of a language learn the language. From talking to their parents at home, instead of just at school, inheritance can be an action or a thing. It is something passed down by one person to another, usually through death. Often, this is property or money from a family member, like in this example. My inheritance from my grandmother includes a little house on the coast. But inheritances are not always welcomed. Listen, my inheritance from my new job is an old, dirty office. And a brief note on the word inherit. Inherit is a verb. It can mean. Either receiving something from someone at birth, or when someone dies. When you are born, you receive or inherit physical and mental traits from your parents or ancestors, like in these examples. She inherited her blue eyes from her father. I inherited. My father's poor eyesight. We can also use inherit in the same way we talk about inheritance, but as a verb. The brothers will inherit their mother's house when she dies. Please let us know if these examples and explanations have helped you, Nora. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews dot com. Our story this week is Kish. It was written by Jack London. Here is Shep O'Neill to tell you the story. Kish lived at the edge of the polar sea. He had seen thirteen suns in the Eskimo way of keeping time. Among the Eskimos. The sun each winter leaves the land in darkness, and the next year, a new sun returns, so it might be warm again. The father of Kish had been a brave man, but he had died hunting for food. Kish was his only son. Kish lived alone with his mother, Ikiga. One night, the village council met in the big igloo of Kloshkwan, the chief. 
Kish was there with the others. He listened, then waited for silence. He said, It is true that you give us some meat, but it is often old and tough meat and has many bones. The hunters were surprised. This was a child speaking against them, a child talking like a grown man. Kish said, My father, Bok, was a great hunter. It is said that Bok brought home more meat than any of the two best hunters, and that he divided the meat so that all got an equal share. Nah, nah, the hunters cried. Put the child out, send him to bed. He should not talk to graybeards this way. Kish waited until the noise stopped. You have a wife, Ugluk, he said, and you speak for her. My mother has no one but me, so I speak. As I say, Bok hunted greatly but is now dead. It is only fair, then, that my mother, who was his wife, and I, his son, should have meat when the tribe has meat. I, Kish, son of Bok, have spoken. Again there was a great noise in the igloo. The council ordered Kish to bed. It even talked of giving him no food. Kish jumped to his feet. Hear me, he cried. Never shall I speak in the council igloo again. I shall go hunt meat like my father, Bok. There was much laughter when Kish spoke of hunting. The laughter followed Kish as he left the council meeting. The next day, Kish started out for the shore where the land meets the ice. Those who watched saw that he carried his bow and many arrows. Across his shoulder was his father's big hunting spear. Again, there was laughter. One day passed, then a second. On the third day, a great wind blew. There was no sign of Kish. His mother, Ikiga, put burned seal oil on her face to show her sorrow. The women shouted at their men for letting the little boy go. The men made no answer, but got ready to search for the body of Kish. Early next morning, Kish walked into the village. Across his shoulders was fresh meat. Go, you men, with dogs and sleds. Follow my footsteps. Travel for a day, he said. There is much meat on the ice, a she-bear and her two cubs. His mother was very happy. Kish, trying to be a man, said to her, Come, Ikiga, let us eat, and after that I shall sleep, for I am tired. There was much talk after Kish went to his igloo. The killing of a bear was dangerous, but it was three times more dangerous to kill a mother bear with cubs. The men did not believe Kish had done so, but the women pointed to the fresh meat. At last, the men agreed to go for the meat that was left, but they were not very happy. One said that even if Kish had killed the bear, he probably had not cut the meat into pieces. But when the men arrived, they found that Kish had not only killed the bear, but had also cut it into pieces, just like a grown hunter. So began the mystery of Kish. On his next trip, he killed a young bear. And on the following trip, 
a large male bear and its mate. Then there was talk of magic and witchcraft in the village. He hunts with evil spirits, said one. Maybe his father's spirit hunts with him, said another. Kish continued to bring meat to the village. Some people thought he was a great hunter. There was talk of making him chief after old Kloshkwan. They waited, hoping he would come to council meetings, but he never came. I would like to build an igloo, Kish said one day, but I have no time. My job is hunting, so it would be just if the men and women of the village who eat my meat build my igloo. And the igloo was built. It was even bigger than the igloo of the chief, Kloshkwan. One day, the Gluck talked to Kish. It is said that you hunt with evil spirits, and they help you kill the bear. Is not the meat good? Kish answered. Has anyone in the village yet become sick after eating it? How do you know evil spirits are with me? Or do you say it because I am a good hunter? Ugluk had no answer. The council sat up late talking about Kish and the meat. They decided to spy on him. On Kisha's next trip, two young hunters, Beam and Bon, followed him. After five days, they returned. The council met to hear their story. Brothers, Beam said, we followed Kish, and he did not see us. The first day he came to a great bear. Kish shouted at the bear loudly. The bear saw him and became angry. It rose high on its legs and growled, but Kish walked up to it. We saw it, Bon, the other hunter said. The bear began to run toward Kish. Kish ran away, but as he ran, he dropped a little round ball on the ice. The bear stopped and smelled the ball, then ate it. Kish continued to run, dropping more balls on the ice. The bear followed and ate the balls. The council members listened to every word. Bim continued the story. The bear suddenly stood up straight and began to shout in pain. Evil spirits, said Ugluk. I do not know, said Bon. I can tell only what my eyes saw. The bear grew weak. Then it sat down and pulled at its own fur with its sharp claws. Kish watched the bear that whole day. For three more days, Kish continued to watch the bear. It was getting weaker and weaker. Kish moved carefully up to the bear and pushed his father's spear into it. And then, asked Kloshkwan, and then we left. That afternoon, the council talked and talked. When Kish arrived in the village, the council sent a messenger to ask him to come to the meeting. But Kish said he was tired and hungry. He said his igloo was big and could hold many people if the council wanted a meeting. Kloshkwan led the council to the igloo of Kish. Kish was eating, but he welcomed them. Kloshkwan told Kish that two hunters had seen him kill a bear, and then in a serious voice to Kish, he said, We want to know how you did it. Did you use magic and witchcraft? Kish looked up and smiled. 
No, Kloshkwan. I am a boy. I know nothing of magic or witchcraft. But I have found an easy way to kill the ice bear. It is headcraft, not witchcraft. And will you tell us, Hokish? Kloshkwan asked in a shaking voice. I will tell you. It is very simple. Watch. Kish picked up a thin piece of whalebone. The ends were pointed and sharp as a knife. Kish bent the bone into a circle. Suddenly, he let the bone go, and it became straight with a sharp snap. He picked up a piece of seal meat. So, he said, first make a circle with a sharp, thin piece of whalebone. Put the circle of bone inside some seal meat. Put it in the snow to freeze. The bear eats the ball of meat with the circle of bone inside. When the meat gets inside the bear, the meat gets warm and the bone goes snap. The sharp points make the bear sick. It is easy to kill then. It is simple. Ugluk said, Oh! Koshkwan said, Ah! Each said something in his own way, and all understood. That is the story of Kish, who lived long ago on the edge of the polar sea. Because he used headcraft instead of witchcraft, he rose from the poorest igloo to be the chief in the village. And for all the years that followed, his people were happy. No one cried at night with pains of hunger. You have heard the story, Quiche. It was written by Jack London. Your storyteller was Shep O'Neill. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak.